let's dive into the first of our three scientific panels. And this first panel focuses on optimizing human performance for all people. And I'm joined today by three experts, Dr. Maylene Lindholm from Stanford University School of Medicine, Dr. Andrew McCullough from the University of California, San Diego, and Dr. Sachin Panda from the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. Thanks to all of you for being here. And everyone joining the live stream, you're welcome to start typing questions for the panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll take a few audience questions at the end of each panel. And it's great if you think of a question, just enter it during the panel instead of waiting for the end. So I'll start with just a couple questions for the, for the experts. And first to you, Maylene, why study athletes? What are some examples of how this can help everyday people? Well, um, we can learn a lot from the extreme. So when systems are pushed to the limit. So just as we learn from disease, uh, we can learn from the other end of the spectra. So people at the peak of human performance. And a classic example from genetics is uh, Ira Mentorenta, a Finnish Nordic skier who dominated in the mid 60s. And in-depth studies of him and his family later revealed a genetic variant in the hormone receptor for EPO, which stimulates uh, production of oxygen transporting red blood cells. So Mentoranta could therefore get a lot more oxygen out to his muscles, which of course gave him a huge advantage. And through him, um, we've learned a lot more about this uh, molecular system, uh, which was significant for understanding performance but also have implications for people suffering from low levels of red blood cells, for example. And I think um, as we understand more about individual variability in different physiological systems like this, that will help us to provide more targeted treatments and eventually also exercise prescriptions to optimize the effect for each and every one of us. That's really interesting. Yeah, I understand it's a a great story. It's led to new medications that are now widely used for people who can't absorb uh, as much oxygen as they need to to stay healthy. So thanks for that. So Sachin, you're an expert in circadian rhythms. And every time we talk, I learn something new. There are a lot of factors that affect performance, sleep, diet, training history. How do you untangle these variables? Yes, Scott, you are right that sleep, nutrition, and exercise constitute the foundation for health and peak performance. And we are systematically testing how each of them affect performance. For example, we discovered that eating all calories within a consistent eight to 10 hours window every day can improve physiology, sustain optimum metabolism and brain function. We also find the same eating pattern combined with healthy nutrition can improve sleep, sense of energy, endurance, and motor coordination, all of which are important for preventing and managing disease for all of us and for reaching peak performance and sustain it for elite athletes. As part of this amazing public-private partnership, we will understand the biological mechanisms underlying how sleep, nutrition, ex and exercise affect health and peak performance. At the same time, in partnership with UNESCO, we are looking forward to translating these findings to everyone around the world. Thank you so much, Sachin. Now you're at Salk right next door to UC San Diego. Andrew, uh, can you tell us about an exciting result from the Alliance that uh, affects us all. Thank you, Scott. In the past few months alone, the Alliance investigators have already reported some really exciting new discoveries. And just one example from investigators here at UC San Diego, where they have developed a novel way of using magnetic resonance imaging to reveal the cellular nature and the severity of skeletal muscle injury. And this greater detail and precision should help clinicians and trainers to make more accurate decisions about whether an athlete is ready to return to play or needs more time and rehabilitation. Yeah, obviously super critical to know when it's possible to return to life, return to play, return to sport, return to 50 or 100%. So just a question for the whole group. Uh, there's a lot of new capabilities from wearable sensors. How do you see those uh, playing into to your research and the research of the Alliance? 
So this is a really exciting and rapidly growing area, Scott. As you well know, we can now collect new continuous non-invasive measurements of human performance, physiological vital signs, and even body metabolism, such as blood glucose and ketone levels. And this unprecedented volume of new data is really allowing us to use AI and simulation to predict other important parameters that can't be measured directly. Your own colleagues at Stanford, for example, recently showed how smartwatch measurements can actually be used to predict clinical measurements from blood tests. And I think these new algorithms and simulations will also allow us to use these data to predict future events, such as the increased risk of overtraining or injury. Yeah. Yeah, there's another example of um, wearables and its impact uh, from our own circadian rhythm field. For example, almost for 20, 25 years ag um, ago, people discovered that uh, peak performance, athletic performance actually is as it speak in the late afternoon or evening. And that led to further research showing that, uh, yes, our body physiology is at its peak. Our risk for injury is also at minimum in the late afternoon. But then only recently, a couple of years ago, uh, circadian rhythm researchers partnered with wearable and metabolism research to put continuous glucose monitor on people with type two diabetes and put them on an exercise regimen. And what we discovered is amazing because type two diabetics who did high intensity interval training in the morning actually saw their blood glucose level increase and remain increased throughout the day through the CGM. Whereas the same individuals when they exercised in late afternoon, they could successfully reduce their blood glucose, both morning blood glucose and throughout the day, their blood glucose remained low. So this is a clear example of how continuous glucose monitor, a widely used now uh, wearable can help everybody manage their blood glucose optimally. Fantastic. Uh, every time I hear from you, Sachin, I have to adjust my daily schedule. So thanks for that. Maylene, any comments on the new technologies, wearables, how that might affect you, uh, research you're doing? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with Sachin and Andrew. I think this is very exciting. And I'm personally especially excited to be able to combine the continuous data that we can get from wearables and wearables keep developing. So we keep getting more and more different types of, of physiological data. And to be able to combine that with both the imaging data that there's a lot of, of plans for it within this alliance and also the molecular data that we're hoping to generate from, uh, from different musculoskeletal tissues in, in athletes, I think it's gonna be very exciting to be able to combine this through AI and, and machine learning. Yeah, the questions now coming in from the audience. Oh, they're coming in on my phone here. So Dr. McCullough or any of the panelists, how does the Alliance plan to bridge basic science research to translational work that will impact uh, communities and athletes? Thank you for asking. Uh, that is really an important goal of the Alliance, which is highly interdisciplinary from basic science all the way through to translation with the goal, as Clara has pointed out, of really having an impact on athletes and everyone. And so in order to bridge this gap between basic science and uh, translation and practice, uh, one of the strategies that we're using in the Alliance is to develop detailed computational models and simulations that synthesize the biological principles with the measurements uh, in order to be able to make predictions and to understand the mechanisms by which changes in things like uh, diet, sleep, and training affect performance. Yeah, fantastic. Sachin, do you want to comment? Yeah, so I guess uh, uh, Clara's vision actually was to combine basic, trans basic and translational research. And as a result, we do have innovation hubs which will immediately take basic science research and try to translate, optimize, and then disseminate to the public. At the same time, the Alliance also has communications um, integrated into it so that some of these findings that are applicable immediately to the general public can be disseminated. We will partner with uh, various uh, organizations, uh, sports organization, physiology, heart association, et cetera. And most importantly, we are also partnering with UNESCO, 
which has footprint in over 180 countries. So this way, the Alliance already has a framework, very strong framework to do basic science research and also translate responsibly to the right audience. Awesome, thank you. You know, we've got over 500 people watching and now I'm getting a ton of questions. Rocky Twan just asked one, a world leading in regenerative biology, but I have to close this panel because we have two other panels. I love working with all you all and uh, I appreciate you being here for the panel. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Yeah. Thank See you very you. much. Thank you.